finally, there were some various other provisions um, of the Family Court Act and the Domestic Relations Law that were amended. Can we summarize those for our oh, listeners? Okay. I think you're talking about the order of protection. Uh, chapter 341 of the, of the laws of 2010, which was effective August 13th. That's the only one that was not an October bill. Okay, so let's talk about it. Um, orders of protection. You come home at night, um, you've had a couple of drinks, and you assault your husband. He would have a right to call the police and get an order of protection against you and say, look, I was just assaulted or I was abused, and this just happened. But that's not always what happens. That happens, and then you beg him, please don't do anything about it. I promise I'll stop drinking. I'll be better. And of course, it's you. It's husbands or wives. doesn't matter who. Um, and, and so, you know, like, give me another chance. And nothing happens for a period of time. And then something else happens, but not that great. And... You used to go in and try to rely on that first incident, and the court would say, that's too stale. You know, you waived your rights to it. We're not going to do anything. Well, the statute right now says that the acts or alleged events, the court shall not deny an order of protection solely on the basis that the acts or events alleged are not relatively contemporaneous with the date of the application. Um, And the duration of any order shall not by itself be a factor in determining the length of any final order. Um, it, apply, it applies to all orders of protection pending or entered into after, October, after August 13th. Um, the legislature is, is basically saying, you got to look at what happened. And just because it happened a couple of months ago, I believe they're going to require some kind of pattern. They'll give relief. The real issue is going to be if something happened in, in, in July and nothing ever happens again, but in October, my wife gets mad at me. Can she get an order of protection based upon what happened in in July. I don't think that was the intention if nothing else happened, but we'll see. You know, unfortunately, in in these days of post-O.J. Simpson, which seem to be going on for a very long time, courts are afraid not to give orders of protection when somebody alleges abuse, um, which is almost the exact opposite of what it was 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. All right, so so now that we've went through... The, the five changes, and uh, you've given us both your opinion and the, the letter of the law. Can you just share with our listeners maybe some practical advice as to how to address or utilize the major components of this legislation? Okay, sure. I think that with respect to getting a divorce— I think people ought to recognize that we are now going to probably be a no-fault state. I think that people will not be able to control, who control the money, be able to control my ability to hire a lawyer. I think the courts will be much more willing to grant relief. And I think, frankly, when a lawyer gets hired by, let's call it the husband, and receives a phone call from somebody who says, listen, Mrs. Jones is here. She wants to hire me. You guys got all the dough. Um, why don't you pay my retainer? I think husband's lawyer is going to have to think long and hard about whether or not he wants to continue to say no or whether he's going to say, sure, under these circumstances, let's work a deal. Because if you don't do that, then when Mrs. Jones's lawyer says, okay, I'll take the case, my first application is to the court. Give me counsel fees. By the way, I try, judge. So maybe you should give me a little extra because they've already told you how difficult they're going to be. With respect to, to temporary maintenance guidelines, I, we, need, we need to see some decisions. I don't think it works. I mean, it's not that it's good or bad legislation. I think on a temporary basis, it's poorly thought out. And so I think that will either engender a lot of litigation or we're going to get a couple of Supreme Court judges who say, this doesn't work, this makes little or no sense, that's being studied anyway, and I want to wait for a study. So therefore, I'm going to use the standards that I used in the past, and this is why I've done it, and that's perfectly legitimate. They can do that. That's not a problem. With respect to modification, I think you're going to see a lot of modifications starting three years from now. I think you're going to see an open door to modifications. I think from a societal point of view, it probably makes sense. Look, Mark, we're dealing right now over the last number of years in, if, if not a deflationary, a recessionary area of time in which the cost of living is not necessarily going up and may even be going down. And if we did an agreement three or four years ago, 
the child support I get is probably okay. But I practiced a whole lot during the 1970s when, you know, interest rates in the bank today, they advertise they're very big. At, you got a 1.20. Well, I remember when they used to say 17%. Uh, and the reason they said 17% was because we had a terribly inflationary period of time. And, and we had double digit, digit inflation. And therefore, an agreement that was four or five years old in child support was woefully inadequate. I think this is a recognition that we may have that again and that they're opening a door to it. Um, And frankly, uh, without getting too deeply involved in the philosophical argument about whether my children should share in my income as I make more money when I'm no longer married to their spouse, one could argue that they should have some rights into it. With respect to the orders of protection, I think that's part of a tendency to err on the side of protection as opposed to err on the side of, my God, they didn't give the order protection, and this time he killed her. Well, Henry, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Obviously, there's items that are here that that are both positive. There are things that that I think, uh, as as a matrimonial attorney, you've identified that maybe could use some more thought, and and maybe uh, only the future will tell us how it's going to pair out. Uh, but our guest today has been Henry Berman of the law firm Berman, Bavero, Fruco, and Gals. If you have any questions on matrimonial family law issues, I'm sure Henry will be able to assist you. You can reach him at his White Plains office, and his telephone number is area code 914-997-7100. As always, our audience is welcome to contact our offices if you have any questions or comments. Stay connected with us. We're on the web at www msgcpa.com, where you can also subscribe to our newsletter, Forensic Perspectives. We can also be found on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and of course by phone. And for those of you that are familiar with our blog, ForensicPerspectives.com, uh, I've recently posted a blog on, on these changes, and, and I think if you enjoyed uh, Henry's uh, review of the legislation, you'll also enjoy our blog. Your topic suggestions for future broadcasts are always welcome. Until our next podcast, this is Mark Gottlieb. Thank you for joining us. You have just enjoyed another episode of Forensic Perspectives, hosted by financial expert Mark Gottlieb. For questions and or comments regarding this broadcast, please feel free to contact Mark by phone at 516-829-4936 or via email at msgcpa at msgcpa.com. We also encourage you to visit our website, www.msgcpa.com. The opinions and commentary in the preceding program provided by our host and guests are for informational and educational purposes only and may not be their personal or professional opinion. No accounting, tax, or legal advice is being provided. The information provided within this broadcast is not an invitation for an attorney-client or accountant-client relationship. One should always seek the advice of competent professionals to assist in their specific needs. In addition, this podcast will not be updated for changes in accounting practices or law. As such, one should not rely on any information provided by this podcast. References to resources are provided solely for the listener's convenience. We have not reviewed or verified any information, advertising, products, resources, or other materials mentioned herein. This broadcast is copyright of Mark S. Gottlieb, CPA PC, all rights reserved. Any redistribution or reproduction of part or all of this broadcast is strictly prohibited unless authorized in writing.